Everybody can please be seated, if you will. <laughs> Provost Lieberman, members of the Peabody National Advisory Council, distinguished guests, faculty, staff, and alumni of the Peabody Institute, and of course, members of the graduating class of the Peabody Conservatory. It is my distinct pleasure to welcome you to the Peabody Conservatory's 134th graduation exercises, which are part of the commencement exercises closing the Johns Hopkins University's 140th academic year. I want to offer my heartiest congratulations to each and every one of our graduates here today. I'm also delighted to see so many parents and relatives and friends here to celebrate with you, our graduating students. I know that your families have shared in every challenge and every success you have experienced throughout your time here at Peabody and maybe are even breathing a sigh of relief today. You could not have achieved that which you have achieved that we celebrate this morning without their love and support. And to the families of our graduates, we say thank you. And I also want to recognize and thank our faculty for the irreplaceable role they have played in bringing you, our students, to this point today. We owe our faculty a debt of gratitude for their remarkable commitment to our students. That commitment is palpable each and every day here at Peabody. Please join me. I'm now honored to invite the Provost of Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Robert Lieberman, to the podium to offer a greeting on behalf of the university. But before I do that, on a personal note, I want to thank Provost Lieberman, who steps down this summer to return full-time to teaching and research for his wisdom and counsel and his dedication and commitment to recognizing the importance of Peabody to the university. It means a great deal to all of us, and we thank you. Provost Lieberman. Thank you very much, Fred. Good morning, everyone. It's a real honor and privilege to be here with you on this uh, tremendously special occasion. So graduates, before I go any further, um, I just want to ask all of you to join me in a round of applause. Um, not for you, we'll have plenty of time to applaud you, but to your family, your friends, and all the people who supported you during your time here. So let's hear it. And to those family and friends who are here with us today, thank you uh, for your support and for sharing with us these exceptionally skilled, gifted, talented people who are gathered here today. As Fred uh, and, and others here know, um, I have a, a, a deep passion for music. It's an important part of my, my life and my family's life. And I remain in awe of the people like you who make it. Um, in fact, I'm so inspired by the artistry that, uh, that, that's represented here in this room today um, that I thought for a moment about following the lead of Rita Moreno, the award-winning actor and singer, who recently delivered a commencement address at the Berklee College of Music in Boston. Um, in, in full regalia, the 84-year-old uh, actress wrapped a portion of her remarks. Now, not to worry. Um, I, you know, I was a pretty fair performer in my time, and that time was some time ago. Um, but um, I'm not going to try and emulate uh, Ms. Moreno, and, and, and my rapping ability is not uh, what it once was. Um, and I can't do anything on stage half as well as she can. Um, but I think her message was an important one. She rhymed, your talent may be terrific, your writing prolific, but do you have the motivation to use your creation for this generation? If you, if you haven't seen the, the clip, I, I would encourage you to look it up on YouTube. It's quite something. Um, I'm not going to deliver, beyond that, I'm not going to deliver any kind of performance today, um, nor am I going to devote my time uh, uh, up here uh, this morning to extolling the importance or power of music to exalt the human spirit. You all know that uh, as well as I do, if not better. I want to focus for a moment uh, on the world beyond Friedberg Hall, beyond the Peabody Conservatory, beyond these walls. And more important, I want to concentrate on some of the hopes that we at Johns Hopkins have for you as you take your place in that world, 
no longer as students, but as graduates and as professionals. Your final 13 months or so here at Peabody, which is of course located here in Baltimore City, have been marked not only by your uh, studies, um, um, by your, uh, and all of your work, but also by protests, uprising, and even tragedy. These dramatic events that unfolded just a few miles uh, from here spurred many of us to consider and confront anew a range of challenging societal issues, such as economic and racial inequality, structural and institutional racism, diversity and inclusion, insufficient educational opportunities, and the so-called war on drugs, among many other matters. Let me underscore that while we may have confronted these issues anew, there's nothing new about them, and there's nothing small either. These are big and seemingly intractable issues. These are issues that often seem so daunting that we occasionally, if not frequently, find ourselves shaking our heads with a sense of futility and questioning our abilities as individuals or as institutions to make even the smallest contribution to the creation of a better and more just world. I said a few minutes ago that my message for you today is about hope, and my hope for you is that you will banish any such doubts that may arise in your own minds. My hope is that you will recognize and apply your unique abilities to make a difference, to make wherever you call home, here or elsewhere, a better place. Um, I said I used to be a performer, I'm now a social scientist, so I can't help uh, supplementing these observations with some supporting evidence. Two uh, highly esteemed colleagues uh, at, um, uh, at, at, on the faculty at Johns Hopkins, Stephanie DeLuca and Catherine Eden, recently uh, published a book called Coming of Age in the Other America. For more than a decade, these colleagues tracked scores of Baltimore children and their families who lived in high, at least for a time in high-rise public housing here in the city. They were, these, these families lived in areas of concentrated poverty. And, and Eden and DeLuca discovered something very important and something with which I think you, with your gifts and your talents and your background, can help. They found that kids who have a passion or a hobby that motivated them were more likely to excel in school than their counterparts who did not have such motivating hobbies. And these authors refer to these passions and hobbies as identity projects. Here are some numbers. I said I'm a social scientist, I can't resist. Only 58% of the young people without such an identity project graduated from high school. But those with an identity project, those who had something outside of school, outside of their studies, that focused their passion and attention and commitment, those kids graduated from high school at a rate of more than 90%. That's an obvious and remarkable difference that has so many positive implications. High school graduates enjoy a much higher employment rate than non-graduates. Um, and a high school diploma is quite obviously a prerequisite for college, and therefore college graduation, which confers enormous benefits and upward mobility to many in our society. A recent study makes clear that the children of college graduates are far more likely to attend college themselves. How much more likely? The chances that an American young person will not graduate from college if his or her parents did not all gradu already graduate from college is greater than 70% and so on for their children and their children's children. So you see a single identity project, a single child whose prospects are brightened can make an enormous difference and can create a virtuous cycle that endures for generations. All right, so there's my lecture for the morning, but what does this all have to do with you? You certainly didn't come here to listen to me spew a bunch of statistics. Well, I can think of no better identity project than music and no better mentors to help our children and the children in communities around the country and around the world make, uh, uh, make, an, identity, um, um, uh, make an identity project of music than you. I know that the months and years ahead are going to be almost inconceivably busy for you as you establish careers and homes and families and so much more. But try to carve out just a little time for the young person down the street, around the corner, or across the city. I'm not given to making guarantees in life because so little is certain, but I do guarantee you this. The time you invest in others 
will produce the biggest return of your lives. If any of you is wondering, well, this sounds good in concept, but how exactly do I do it? I suppose I could prescribe some kind of formula or offer some example for direct action. But I need not do so in front of an audience that is brimming with so much creativity and ingenuity and initiative as I know that you've already demonstrated in your time here at Peabody. During your years here, I've watched often in, uh, in awe and appreciation of you taken responsibility time and time again for the change that you sought, for the change that was right and just and that would make a difference. President Obama said uh, that ch uh, change will not come if we wait for some other person or some other time. We are the ones we've been waiting for. We are the change that we seek. You've lived up to and fulfilled these words and you can do so again, you will do so again. And I know that we'll hear from uh, many of you over the coming years um, as we celebrate your future accomplishments and reflect back um, on the start you got here at Peabody. Um, Bach uh, often joked that um, it's easy to play any musical instrument. All you have to do is touch the right key at the right time and the instrument will play itself, right? Um, uh, I know, of course, as you do better than I, that it's not quite like that, uh, quite the opposite. Um, the same will be true of getting involved in the lives of others. It will require work and sacrifice and commitment, but it too will be worth it. So my final words to the class of 2016 are these. You can change our world for the better with your songs and with yourselves. And my hope is that you will do so and that we will be able to reap the benefits of your talent, your creativity, and your commitment for years to come. So on behalf of the university, I'm delighted to offer my congratulations. I wish every one of you all the best. And I cannot wait to see, and more importantly, hear you again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Rob. Class of 2016, I'll have some thoughts that I do want to share with you a little bit later in the program, but most importantly, we are here today to honor you with the awarding of diplomas. That's a big moment. We want to get to that, but we're not quite there yet. As you well know, more than anything else, we are about music. And so to spotlight and represent your many musical accomplishments, we've invited members of the graduating class to perform at this ceremony. We're honored to present these farewell performances as representative of the fantastic class of 2016. Please welcome the first of our performers.
Good morning. Good morning. Oh, come on. You should be excited. Good morning. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Good morning to everyone here celebrating this special rite of passage. Congratulations to the students sitting before me on your achievement of all your hard work. And thank you to the parents, the family, oh, excuse me, the friends, the teachers, the mentors, the administrators for getting them here. Hmm. Nothing like stage fright, y'all. <laughs> I am obviously not Matt Rupsich, <laughs> who injured his back and sadly could not be here to induct you into the Society of Peabody Alumni. Um, although, of course, he sends his felicitations and warmly welcomes you into the fold. My name is Elizabeth Berman, and I am the incoming president of the Society of Peabody Alumni. And while my duties do not technically begin until July 1st, I am thrilled to personally give you my congratulations on a job well done. I also extend my welcome into the extraordinary vibrant network of alumni, not just of Peabody, but of the Johns Hopkins University. I am an alumna of both Peabody in oboe performance and the Zanville Krieger School of Arts and Sciences up at Homewood. My path to this very stage today began with my mom moving to Baltimore from semi-rural Mississippi, where I was born, to complete her DMA here at Peabody. Little did I know that Peabody was also in my future, where I would build the foundation for the person I am today, where I would build a great network of friends, wonderful colleagues, and amazing musicians, and also meet my husband. After years of music making and instruction, nonprofit arts administration became my calling, and I now work a mere seven blocks south at the Chesapeake Shakespeare Company in the harbor. The biggest lesson I have learned over the last decade is that life happens. <laughs> Don't expect things to go exactly as you planned, especially once children are in the picture. Don't believe you parents know what I'm talking about. <laughs> Don't believe things will fall into your lap. Go out and create opportunities, not just for yourself, but for your colleagues, your family, and your communities. Use the networking tools of our alumni associations, plural. Yes, the Hopkins Alumni Association is at your disposal. To open doors for others, and in return, have doors open for you. The best way of doing this, of course, is to stay connected. Our fellow Hopkins alumni, more than 200,000 individuals from nine schools with hundreds of specialties, are a diverse group that represent all walks of life from across the country and around the world. Stick a pin in that Peabody alumni map so we know where you are and what you're doing. You can get some use out of those stress balls you got earlier this year, too. And go hop online, where you can now network with current Hopkins students and alumni from across the divisions. Remember, Peabody and Hopkins are part of who you are. Hopefully, you had as fulfilling an experience as I did as a student. Now consider how you might return that favor to the hundreds and thousands of students that will come after you. As Matt Rupsich would say, we will always thank you for your time, for your talent, and for your treasure. So take care of yourselves and keep in touch. Congratulations. Good morning. It gives me pleasure to call attention to all of the students who have received prizes or awards for the specific achievements. Their names are listed in the program, those who are graduating today as well as those who are not. On behalf of the conservatory, I thank the many friends of Peabody whose donations have made these awards possible. I now ask all those students, both on stage and in the hall, to stand at their places so that we may applaud them for their accomplishments. The names of the recipients of three of the prizes listed could not be included in the program because the recipients of those prizes could not be selected until after all the grades had been submitted. They are the recipients of the Azalea H. Thomas Prizes and the Peabody Alumni Award. 
I ask the following students to come forward when their names are called. The Azalea H. Thomas Prizes are awarded to the instrumentalist and the vocalist who's, who graduate with the highest grade point average in theory earned throughout the bachelor degree program. This year, we have a four-way tie. <laughs> Each of these students earned the same GPA in theory throughout their programs, specifically a 4.0. So the prize will be shared equally among them. The Azalea H. Thomas Prize for Instrumentalists is awarded to Eric Meyer, Sean Myers, Ian Streeter, and Rebecca Wu. Come on up. Thomas Prize to a vocalist with the highest grade point average in theory earned throughout the bachelor degree program is awarded to John No. Please join us on stage. was established by the Peabody Alumni Association and is annually awarded to the graduating student who attains the highest grade point average for the entire bachelor degree program. This year, with a grade point average of 3.99, <laughs> come on now, <laughs> with a grade point average of 3.99, the Peabody Alumni Award is shared by Sean Myers and Eric Meyer. Mr. Linro to come to the podium with me, and Dr. David Smook. <laughs> the Excellence in Teaching Award was established in 1992 through the generosity of the Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association as a way in which each of the divisions of the university can annually recognize the extraordinary dedication and accomplishments of at least one of our many fine teachers. It is my pleasure at this time to assist Mr. Jay Linro, President of the Johns Hopkins Alumni Association, in presenting this year's Excellence in Teaching Award to Dr. Smook. David Smook, your multifaceted career and singular talents as a composer and performer have earned you many accolades over the years, not least of which from the Washington Post, 
which describes your music as superb and a kaleidoscopic sonic universe where anything could happen. You've been honored by BMI, McDowell Colony, the Maryland State Arts Council, the Greater Baltimore Cultural Alliance, the Virginia Center for the Creative Arts, and the National Association of Composers USA, the Atlantic Center for the Arts, and SCI ASCAP, among others. Today we honor you for inspiring, challenging, and developing your students through your creative and engaging teaching and your tireless example of generosity, enthusiasm, and love of music. Described as a natural teacher, charismatic and compassionate, you create an open and inviting educational environment that nourishes students intellectually, helps them grow musically, and connects them to the wider world of current events and contemporary society. Your classroom is known as a place where students are respected and where questions can be asked, that unorthodox ideas and opposing viewpoints are welcome and encouraged. Students notice that you continually work to integrate new and unconventional material into your courses to provide unique and fresh perspectives on music, and note that your passion for both music and knowledge is infectious. Students know you as a dedicated mentor whose interest in their success extends well beyond the classroom and appreciate in particular your proactive and unflinching support for students and others struggling with social pressures, as well as your significant personal investments in extracurricular work and projects. For many, your influence has changed the course of their personal and professional lives. The bonds you build with students continue well after they have left Peabody, leading one alumnus to comment that, quote, not only is he a brilliant teacher, composer, and performer, he is a brilliant friend, end quote. Having published more than 150 columns on New Music Box, you are well known as a passionate advocate for and practitioner of new music. Your leadership in bringing the New Music Gathering 2016 to Peabody and in helping to create and launch Now Hear This, have enriched the new music scene in Baltimore, provided unparalleled learning and performance opportunities for members of the Peabody community, and helped establish and enhance Peabody's reputation in the bigger new music world. As both a Peabody alumnus and a member of the faculty since 2007, your unique contributions to Peabody have long helped shape the academic, musical, and social culture of our campus and had a lasting positive impact on your fellow students, colleagues, and fellow alumni. Dr. David Smook, in recognition of your many gifts and accomplishments, and with our profound gratitude for all that you are and the good that you do, it is our pleasure to present to you the Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association's Excellence in Teaching Award 2016. Jay Lenro and the Alumni Association, and special, special thanks to the students and alumni who nominated me for this award. I have learned so very much from the Peabody faculty, including when I was a student who walked across this very stage 21 years ago. I remain in awe of these incredible musicians and scholars and cannot believe how fortunate I am to be able to call them colleagues and friends. I am especially grateful to the other faculty in the music theory department with whom I have spent countless hours discussing how we can best convey to all the Peabody students the joy that we find in the arcane aspects of how music works. We trace the Western tradition of music theory back to Pythagoras, who believed that music was a form of mathematical perfection alongside the other sciences in the quadrivium, geometry, arithmetic, and astronomy. In the Renaissance era, theorists began to discuss music as a mode of communication, more closely tied to the trivium of grammar, logic, and rhetoric. In this postmodern era, we view music through many different lenses, each tinted by uncertainty. When we approach music as a rhetorical art, we realize that it's nearly impossible to describe how it communicates and exactly what it says. The scientists working on the cognition of music are no closer to understanding why music moves us than E.T.A. Hoffman was when he, 200 years ago when he claimed that music was the highest form of art because it expresses the ineffable. Today, we question the primacy of Western music 
and realize that the contemporary musician needs to be comfortable working in many different genres and traditions. We find ourselves uncertain as to what being a 21st century musician means and what music education in this new era should entail. As any student who has taken a class with me can tell you, I strongly believe that we need to embrace these uncertainties and ambiguities. The most fun questions, the ones most worth asking, have more than one correct answer. And every question, of course, has how many wrong answers? In, that's correct, infinity. <laughs> Artistry occurs within the twin poles of tradition and originality. New work that does nothing but reprise the old lacks a compelling reason for existing. On the other hand, art that is entirely without precedent risks incomprehensibility. So to my students and former students, I offer this advice. You must find your own magnetism. If you try to copy others, you are dooming yourselves to failure because you can never be anything other than a pale imitation of the original, a doppelganger. And as anyone who is a fan of either Schubert or Dungeons and Dragons can tell you, there are a few things sadder and more dangerous than a doppelganger. <laughs> and the Venn diagram of fans of Schubert and Dungeons and Dragons, the overlap is probably this room. <laughs> You must forge your own path and become the best you that you possibly can become. The good news is that no one will ever be as successful at being you as you can be. I believe that the most important skill that you need as a musician in the 21st century is curiosity. The more that you seek to know about the world around you, the better you will understand yourself and your unique place within this world. As the musical landscape shifts, your curiosity will allow you to navigate across unfamiliar terrain. Where others only see obstacles, curiosity will illuminate new and unique paths. In closing, I'd like to offer special thanks to my wife, Elise Levine, who embodies the epitome of a searching intellect and who continues to teach me to pair my curiosity with compassion and empathy and how important those qualities are to humanity and pedagogy. Thank you.
this is why we do what we do. Uh, we are we're honored to present the George Peabody Medal to Yo-Yo Ma. While he was unable to join us today, the George Peabody Medal for Outstanding Contributions to Music in America will be presented to Yo-Yo in June when he is in town for the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's centennial celebration. Mr. Ma sent the following remarks and asked for them to be read at today's commencement ceremony. I wish I could be here with you today to join you in celebrating the class of 2016 and to express my deep appreciation for this great honor. It is a privilege to receive the George Peabody Medal to be counted in the ranks of the very talented past recipients and to have my name associated with this esteemed institution, first as a member of the Distinguished Artist Council and now in this way. Through the inspiration and generosity of its founder, the Peabody Institute has helped generations of artists, teachers, and scholars to discover and share the wealth of the creative spirit. I believe a great education and great artistry goes beyond the development of skills. It balances knowledge with empathy and imagination. It helps us to connect with each other and it prepares us to engage with the most important challenges in our 21st century world. At Peabody, your renewed commitments to performance, to cultural understanding, and to community engagement are enabling the Institute its faculty and its students to chart a path to a future where art is at the center of society. I'd like to recognize Dean Bronstein and all of your leadership for their inspiring vision. I'd like to thank you again for allowing me to associate myself with it in this way. And I would like to wish all of you a fulfilling future as both artists and as citizens. Congratulations, class of 2016, Yo-Yo Ma. Now, the Four Pillars Award makes its debut this year, and the purpose of this award is to highlight and recognize important work going on in the areas around four key strategic areas of focus for Peabody going forward. Excellence, interdisciplinary experiences, innovation, and community connectivity. This year's inaugural award is for community connectivity and is being given to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra and accepting the award on behalf of the BSO is President and CEO, Paul Leach. And I'm gonna ask Paul to come up and join me at the podium. Before I read the citation, I just wanna say on a personal note how grateful I am and I think all of us are in Baltimore for uh, Paul's leadership over the last 10 years. He's moving on to, to go to the Utah Symphony and Opera as president and CEO, and he's done a fabulous job uh, leading this very important institution here in Baltimore over the last 10 years. So thank you for, you, for all, all that you've done. <laughs> Believing that music and mentorship open doors and that every child should have the opportunity to experience making music, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's Orchids has touched thousands of young lives since its founding in 2008. By providing a strong foundation and developing the whole individual, ORCHID's positions these students for lifelong success in music and in all areas of their lives. More than a music training program, ORCHID's has its mission to use music as a vehicle to provide Baltimore City children with mentoring, encouragement, and vision for a promising future. Its curriculum is devoted to music appreciation, academics, citizenship, community awareness, family, and emotional, social, and physical health. Inspired by Venezuela's El Sistema and designed to create social change, ORCHIDS is the cornerstone of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra's efforts to expand your relevance within the broad and diverse Baltimore community. Under the artistic leadership and direction of BSO Music Director Marin Alsa, ORCHIDS provides music education, instruments, academic instruction, meals, and performance and mentorship opportunities at no cost to students and families. ORCHIDS, which began with just 30 students, now works with six public schools in Baltimore City, providing more than 1,000 children from pre-K through 10th grade with opportunities for creativity, self-expression, cooperative learning, teamwork, academic success, 
and self-esteem. Orchids inspires students to explore all genres of music and your orchestral, choral, drumming, composition, chamber music, and mixed genre ensembles have performed with such diverse artists as Renee Fleming, Matashiyu, Pink Martini, the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, and Hilary Hahn. Students in the Orchids program have played alongside BSO musicians during a halftime show for the National Football League's Baltimore Ravens, accepted the National Arts and Humanities Youth Program at the White House from First Lady Michelle Obama, and traveled to California as part of the Los Angeles Philharmonic's Take a Stand Symposium. They've been recognized for their accomplishments on national public radio, CBS's 60 Minutes, The New York Times, PBS, and The Washington Post. Assessment data indicate they are also doing better in school, scoring higher on standardized tests, and lifting average attendance at their schools. As much as ORCID serves the youth of the community, it also draws on a strong network of community partners, which includes Baltimore City Public Schools, the Peabody Institute, and the Baltimore School for the Arts. In connecting participants, donors, and partner organizations around our shared goals, ORCIDS is truly waving a tapestry of community with untold benefits. ORCIDS is changing Baltimore by inspiring its children to envision a brighter future and giving them the tools to achieve it. In celebration of your broad and deep reach into Baltimore neighborhoods, your meaningful collaborations and your impact on individuals, their families, and their communities, it is our pleasure to present to the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra the Peabody Institute's 2016 Four Pillars Award for Community Connectivity. It is now my honor to introduce the internationally renowned pianist and Peabody alumnus, Awadajan Pratt, to deliver the commencement address. Winner of the 1992 Nomberg International Piano Competition and the recipient of an Avery Fisher Career Grant, Mr. Pratt has performed concerts and recitals around the world. Also a conductor, he has led the National Symphony Orchestra at the Kennedy Center and worked closely with Leonard Slatkin. He has been honored with both the 2008 Johns Hopkins University Alumni Association Distinguished Alumnus Award and the 1995 Peabody Conservatory Young Maestro Award and remains actively involved at Peabody as a member of the recently formed Peabody Diversity Pathway Task Force. Currently professor of piano, artist in residence, and artistic director of the Art of the Piano Festival at the University of Cincinnati College Conservatory of Music, Mr. Pratt is also artistic director of the Cincinnati World Piano Competition. We're proud to welcome back to Peabody on this important occasion, a proud Peabody alum and wonderful representative of Peabody in the world of music. Please join me in welcoming Avadajan Pratt. Thank you. Hello, and a warm thank you to the Peabody family, to the community of Baltimore, and a hearty congratulations to the Peabody class of 2016. To have been asked to give this address is a great honor. I'm grateful for having been recognized here on a number of occasions since my graduation. As Dean Bronstein mentioned, I've been uh, back in the Peabody community as a member of this diversity task force. And I'm very impressed with the honesty, commitment, and quality of, this, quality of the discussions ongoing in that committee that will position Peabody to be a leader in this very important area. This is my second commencement address, and as such, a couple of things about my first happen to be relevant. There's an expression about composers, good composers borrow, great composers steal. I promise you I will be stealing a bit from that address. At that time, my first thoughts drifted to two inspiring commencement addresses that I had read as a student. One by the pianist Glenn Gould, the other by the composer, conductor, and educator Leonard Bernstein. I was doing a lot of reading and thinking about what to talk about when my thoughts drifted to something one of my good friends who was a writer had once said. The first novel you write, you write what you know. 
what you know as yourself. I thought, well, let's see how well I know myself. While I was working on it, I was asked for a title, even a working title. I thought, well, that's it, working title. It was part just, but then I realized there's some truth to that. What your graduates are about to be presented with is a working title. My certificates are in piano, violin, and conducting. Those certificates and diplomas have provided for me a working title. I'm a concert pianist, a professor, and a conductor. I have been, or I am, or have been as well, a fundraiser, a festival organizer, a mentor. I've been the artistic director and creator of three festivals, a collaborator, and an adjudicator. Each of those things, though related to a degree in music, requires a different skill set. My thoughts also drifted to the business world. I thought of one of my good friends who has a master's degree in chemical engineering. He's a head of research and development at Estee Lauder. His career has been peripherally related to chemistry, but his professionally developed skill set has nothing to do with his degrees. He is now and has been for the bulk of his career a businessman, a manager of people and projects, and an innovator. I would like for each one of you, once you leave here, to look at your degree for a minute, reflect on your accomplishment, make sure your name is spelled correctly, <laughs> and file that working title away. You're on the precipice of a distinctly different world than the one at which I appeared some 25 years ago when I left here. The music world is now in many ways a more open place than when I graduated. It is interesting that feats of computer engineering made it possible for there to be more possibilities in careers in music. Who would have thought that something called YouTube could be a springboard to a career in classical music? I would like for you to think about being an innovator to begin your career. Glenn Gould wrote that the artist can be measured by the degree of difficulty of the questions they ask of themselves, by the nature of the challenges they ask of themselves. This posing and resolving of challenges will require of you your fullest capacities of imagination, inspiration, and innovation. I will provide you with a couple of examples of important challenges that I have provided as a teacher and that I faced as a student. Now I challenge you to find a moment to be brave enough to cast aside the concerns of your parents, your teachers, the impending doom of student loan payments, and ask yourself, who am I? What do I love to do, to read about, to hear about, to think about? Do I love music in all its totality? Am I an ambassador for music? Or am I just really good at playing the viola and no one else is? I absolutely believe that every one of us has that thing in life we cannot do without, that thing with which we have to be engaged in every day. For me, that thing was and remains music. I ask you to know that thing that you love the most. I sincerely hope that your answer is music, but you should also be prepared if it is not. Somehow many people manage in their lives daily without being able to do that thing or combination of things that they love. They put it away in their overstuffed drawer of dreams, which may seem like a safe place, but I believe it was Nelson Mandela who said that you must honor that which is within you, the gifts you have, and release them. Otherwise, it will be those things which remain inside of you and will kill you. I had an undergraduate student who for every year, every lesson was prepared to the absolute word of what I asked for every week. Completely well prepared, but never a bar more, never a bar less. Faultless, sort of. It came for decisions about her future and she spoke of master's degree programs. And I said, do you love playing the piano? After a look of terror ran across her face and left, and came back, she said, uh, no. I said, I know. What's the point of going on on this treadmill? After extensive conversations and a round of auditions, she took a year off and eventually realized that what she wanted to do was to help heal people and is now in a very good music therapy program. Without that challenge of taking the time to find out what she loved, she would be frankly still on that treadmill right now. You must imagine either what you know is out there as a career and yourself doing it, or imagine that thing which you love, which doesn't currently have a place in your life, and find the way to its possibility. Glenn Gould talked about the difference of what we know and has been proven to work, which he called positivity, and that which we do not know, or hasn't been proven or tried, which he called negativity. We construct a small frame in which we live, 
that's defined by things that are known. He suggests that artists in particular must in our minds constantly dip into the great unknowns and unprovens as a resource for reaching our dreams. In your every job or circumstance, be alert to the opportunities that lend themselves to your other strengths, whether that means you're good at working with people or developing, transforming, or executing ideas. In our current music industry, this is serious capital. We need people with great inspiration to imagine the transformation of the image and the way of life of what we do and love. If you are open to this, you will discover that you have other talents. Talent, as you will find out, is simply working hard at doing something you love, and surprise, you get good at it. After you've identified your must-do, let no one tell you what is not possible. Among the things an innovator does is to challenge the orthodoxy. I was constantly asked from the age of 16 to 23 by those who are my mentors, when are you going to stop with this two-instrument nonsense? What do you want to be when you grow up? In my mind, I felt that getting two private lessons a week about how music works was an incredible, priceless thing. Well, it did come at a price. Peabody charged me one and a half times tuition. <laughs> Nonetheless, I felt that this was my great capital investment. I had a ton of knowledge and understanding about how music works. I was open to finding my own path as a musician. I did not know what all those hours of learning would mean in my life, but I knew it had to be a good thing. Eventually, I was put to the test by my piano teacher, Robert Wyrick, who issued a powerful challenge to me. A few days after what I thought had been my successful senior recital, just a few days before my 23rd birthday, he sent me a three-page, single-spaced letter. He said to me that what he and others such as Gary Grafman recognized as my talent was, and I quote, an uncanny knack for projecting the piece as an integrated experience to the listener. The audience is aware of the whole at every moment, and so one sense of time and experience is altered by the music. I know of no higher satisfaction of either listener or performer. When that happens, you remember it your whole life. You can count on the fingers of one hand those who are able to do what you can do. I'm reading the letter, I'm like, awesome. <laughs> and then he says in the same paragraph, you have musical ideas that are more eccentric than innovative. You have a technique that gets in the way rather than facilitates. I'm falling, <laughs> stooping as I'm reading. He continued to drive home the point by saying that if somebody hears you when you're under the age of 21, they say, what potential? Over the age of 21, what a waste. That's, gee, that's too bad. He's so talented, and he still can't play the piano. <laughs> and then he said, I think you can fix this problem, but only if you think that it's important. Keep in mind that, as you know, the music business loves prodigies. So, in many ways, read both 30 years ago and today, I was already over the hill at the age of 23. What to do now? After feeling like I'd been punched in the gut, I took the letter to heart. My investment until that point had been directed towards music in general. I now refined it to the piano, and I then spent a great amount of intensity and time thinking about my technique. A couple of years later, when I was 25, I went on retreat to the BAMP Center in Canada for a three-month, very intensive period of independent study without a teacher, trying to consolidate, as I'd worked out, the 420 hours of lessons that I'd had in music school into my own ideas about how music is organized and how to play with technical security. Thirteen months after leaving BAMP and returning to the conservatory, I won Nauberg and started my career. I was incredibly lucky to have a teacher that believed in me and challenged me to deliver to my potential even though by the time of fruition, I was not his student anymore. We must keep in mind that as teachers, we ask for the now of a necessity, but our every sentence plants seeds. I hope ultimately that I'm planting a small one today for you as well. Think of your personal relationship with music, your skill set. Know that you must develop yourself as a whole person, that you must find and be true to what's inside of you to what inspires you, and to what you imagine. Then be completely invested and intense in the pursuit of the realization of your dreams. As to challenges, one of the most important qualities required in the face of challenge or to issue a challenge is courage. But as musicians, we all have this courage. It is reflected daily when we take a breath, when we draw the bow, when we raise our hands to the piano to say, this is how this phrase goes. 
William Yeats wrote powerful words which are so unfortunately often true in his poem, The Second Coming. He wrote that the best lack all conviction and the worst are full of passionate intensity. While I understand what Yeats meant, in my life I try to turn these damning words around. I ask you, the Peabody class of 2016, to be your absolute best, however it is that you define it, to have all the conviction in your ideas, and to execute full of passionate intensity. And please, what I've left out here, but is really important, in your passionate intensity, include loving and appreciating your family and friends, the ones who got you here today. Stay in touch with your teachers, especially the ones who have most productively challenged you. Be a great colleague to your peers as our world is at once large and very small. And nurture a consistent reaching out to those who do not have the opportunities that you have had. Good luck and congratulations again.
I am Kylie Summer, Director of Student Affairs, and it is my pleasure to announce that Dr. Townsend Plant, Associate Dean for Enrollment and Student Life, will present the recipients of the degree of Bachelor of Music, the Graduate Performance Diploma, the degree of Master of Art, the degree of Master of Music, the Artist Diploma, and the degree of Doctor of Musical Arts to the Dean of the Peabody Institute, Dr. Fred Bronstein, and the Provost of the Johns Hopkins University, Dr. Robert Lieberman. The audience is requested to refrain from applauding until after the last diploma in each category has been awarded. With the recipients of the degree Bachelor of Music, please rise. Dr. Bronstein, Dr. Lieberman, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree of Bachelor of Music. Christian Hezon. <laughs> Charles Henry Oler. <laughs> Rachel Marie Salentano. <laughs> Shinchi Dong. Jaquan Timothy Sloan. Alexander Henry Roll. Nicholas Taylor Dolworth. Francesca Lucia Duva. Obin Malhotra. <laughs> Emily Louise Barone. <laughs> Emily is also receiving a Bachelor of Music Education. <laughs> Youngjun Lim. <laughs> Eric Christopher Phillips Owen Meyer. Melody Augustina Swen. John William Craddock. Kelsey Ross. Ari Messenger. Roderick Demings, Jr. Jisoo yeah. Jung. Daniel Rainey. Rongmei An. Moni Guo. Constance Lynn Kaita. <laughs> Kelly Kim. <laughs> Rieko Sushida. <laughs> Andrew Landau. <laughs> Sean Alexander Myers.
Tyrone Jermaine Page. Sarah Ann Manley. Ian Thomas Streeter. Marilyn E. Padigale. Jennifer Kim. Lita Fink. Alexander Hardin. Hyunji Lim. Su Yun Park. So Young Jang. Beverly Wu. Minzo Kim. Jessica Karadkin. Elliot Yang. John Ahn. Mary Patricia Burke. Mary is also receiving a joint degree with Young Shu Tao Conservatory of Music of the National University of Singapore. Shana Cantrell Jones. Shong Yun No. James Sheline. And Carl Friedrich Butterman. Would the recipients of the Graduate Performance Diploma please rise? Dr. Bronstein, Dr. Lieberman, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the Graduate Performance Diploma. Bjorn Thor Grinna. Akra Yunyong Hatoporn. Sun Yong Lee. Chen Chen Gu. Alan Chu. Young Yun Lee. <laughs> Aliyah and Ali Apprentice. Aik Shin Tan. <laughs> Rebecca Wood. <laughs> Zhu Yong Lee. Alexander Ronald Fournier.
the recipients of the degree of Master of Arts please rise? <laughs> Dr. Bronstein and Dr. Lieberman, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree of Master of Arts. Madeline Claire Brombeck. Jose Andres Lobo. James Aaron Mead. Obachuku Odunukwe. Rebecca Jean Wiles. Chai Yang Chao. Would the recipients of the degree of Master of Music please rise? <laughs> Dr. Bronstein, Dr. Lieberman, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree of Master of Music. <laughs> Zha Lin. Chang Liu, Christine Danielle Lyons, Chan Chi Shang, Trevor Ward. Chen Ye Shen. Molly Jung Hae Park. Alexandra Catherine Patterson. Rebecca Ellen Bruce. Natanya Sheva Washer. Catherine Elizabeth Bell. Yeah. Tirza Nicole Hawley. Yeah. Joshua Kenneth Hughes. Yeah. Emily Elise Tate. Grace Hannah Srinivasan. Yeah. Yiting Shea. Yeah. Weili Shea. Yeah. Dominic Brancasio. Yeah. Brian Tracy. Jinju Yao. Sean William Calhoun. Peter Neil Dayton. Wei Guo. Jonathan Hogendobler.
Kyle Anders Kraus. Jason Adam Mulligan. Ifon Gal. Huisi Leong. Chao Leong. Drore Dong. Michelle Rofrano. Paula Gail Most. Joanna Miriam Kuvam. Tyson Lee Moss. Raymond Allen Fisk. Raymond is also receiving a Master of Music in Wind Conducting. Elizabeth Ann Milligan. Ming Xuan Grace Tai. Ping Xin Wu. Yong Ik Zhang. Oscar Somersalo. Meng Su. Jeffrey James Hosier. Crystal Marie Rufinat. Gary Walter Samsell. Adam Garland Swanson. Zoe Melissa Freed. Li Zhao Wang. Joachim Theodore Lim. Benjamin John Mapes. Hyun Jung An. Yu An Chen. Stanley John Delage. Su Jung Kim. Min Hee Park. Monius Villanueva. <laughs> Chen Chen Wang. <laughs> Lior Adin Willinger. <laughs> Wan Yang Zhang. <laughs> Yun Hei Zhang. Kyuri Kang. <laughs> Lin Hung Ya. <laughs> Riskan Kunin. <laughs> Wan Ha Chen. <laughs> Joseph Scott German. Joseph is also receiving a Master of Music in Musicology. Jisoo Hong. Jiaxian Shu. Hanbing Jia. Song Yun Zhang. Jung Min Lee. Yan Chiao. 
Sion Young Seoul. Joseph Spencer Isom. Jacques Pierre Milan. Julia Jia Li Wan. Lauren Anderson. Michael Dodge. Taylor Alexis Louise Dupont. Thomas Alfred Eugene Hochla. Unhe Kim. Taiwan Kim. Ya Yu Li. Recipient of the Artist Diploma, please rise. Dr. Bronstein and Dr. Lieberman, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipient of the Artist Diploma. Jasmine Hogan. Recipients of the degree of Doctor of Musical Arts, please rise. <laughs> Dr. Bronstein and Dr. Lieberman, I have the honor of presenting to you the recipients of the degree of Doctor of Musical Arts. Ai Sin Gao. <laughs> he Yun Chao. <laughs> Zhang Yun Kim. David Griffith Kelly. <laughs> Felix Hell. <laughs> Andre Alexandru Berdetti. John Courtney Crouch. Andrew Hale Austin.
Christina Ann Muncy. Christopher Guy Buchanan. Christopher is also receiving a Master of Music in Musicology. Xiao Ying Lin. So Young Kim. Irene Soon Young Kim. Christine Kim. pleasure of inviting everyone uh, here to a reception in the Peabody Plaza and Dining Hall after the ceremony. Hope you'll join us. I also want to ask you to, um, if you would, to remain in your seats at the end of the ceremony until everyone who is now on stage has left the hall. So thank you for that. Uh, I, I, want, I want to begin by congratulating you and your families again on your graduation. You have made it. Uh, and now you get to go out into the world and to take the next step to use all of the talents and the skills you've acquired to make music and to make a difference. This is, uh, this is my, my second graduation as dean and I continue to be as honored to serve in this role as I was on my very first day. It's been my privilege and joy to work with you during such an exciting time both at Peabody and for classical music at large. In fact, there's so many things that happened at Peabody this past year that it's challenging to decide what to highlight. There were countless concerts and recitals that you participated in, symphonies that you played, operas that you sang, chamber works that you performed, and more. You worked with an incredible faculty and had exposure to artists working at the highest level of the music world. That included working with Marin Alsop, now director of graduate conducting at Peabody, recording a disc for Naxos and the first of a number of recordings by the Peabody Symphony Orchestra. This year, our students also had the chance to work with guest conductors of the Baltimore Symphony Orchestra, artists like Hanu Lintu and newly appointed BSO principal guest conductor, Marcus Stenz. You participated in the inaugural year of the Dean's Symposiums. These symposiums are advancing an ongoing, open, and thoughtful dialogue 
about the future of classical music and the issues and trends facing our field. Your thoughtful questions and the insights and learnings offered by notable guests like Claire Chase, Deborah Rutter, Norman Lebrecht, and others are helping us think differently about that future and how we both shape and respond to it. You embrace the opportunity to create innovative approaches to learning and music through the Dean's Incentive Grants, also new this year. Many of you were part of expanding significantly Peabody's footprint in music of our time with the launch of Now Hear This, our new contemporary chamber ensemble whose performances have generated palpable excitement. And you joined Peabody in hosting New Music Gathering 2016, where more than 300 composers and performers from across the country gathered here to perform, conduct workshops and lectures, all the while sharing exciting new works with each other and Baltimore audiences. You witnessed the launch of the Young Artist Development Series, a partnership between Peabody and El Paso Pro Musica, in which two of your colleagues, Nikita Borisevich and pianist Maggie Lukachina, spent a week-long residency in El Paso working as citizen artists in what for them was a life-changing experience. And it was only a few short weeks ago that many of you participated in the launch of citywide Peabody pop-ups, where more than 40 students fanned out to 20 sites around Baltimore, from Penn Station to the water taxi at the Inner Harbor, from Margaret Brent Elementary School to the Johns Hopkins Medical Center in East Baltimore, and many places in between, all to surprise and delight through impromptu performances. That's the place that I want to pause and talk with you and reflect with you. I want to go a little deeper and make it personal. We've talked about developing and communicating with different audiences and connecting with communities. Today I want to ask you to think about that in a different way and to set aside ingrained perceptions about what we value in musical performance. For the first half of my career, I had the opportunity to play in some pretty wonderful places, like the Kennedy Center or Goodman Hall in New York, to make recordings, to do radio broadcasts on classical stations that had live performance series when we had them, and to do all the things that we as performers deem important and legitimate. I tell you this because as great and as highly valuable as artistic experiences they were, and as satisfying to me as a performer to have that optimal setting to make art the perfect context. The reality is that when I look back on it, those may not have been the most important experiences. When I think now about impact, I remember walking into a school in Lowell, Massachusetts, in a small hall with a not very good piano and sharing a program with traditional Cambodian musicians in which my ensemble of Qualis played a work by Cambodian-American composer Chinarion for an audience of largely Cambodian immigrants, many of whom had lost most, if not all, of their families to the Khmer Rouge. We had played the work Spiral over a hundred times in major halls. Which do you think was among our most memorable performances? Or playing a week of school programs in the dead of winter in upstate New York as part of a community residency that included underserved populations and seeing the look on kids' faces as they watched and heard what a percussionist does, to see a pianist pluck the strings of a piano, and in many cases, to lay eyes on a cello for the first time. While the circumstances in these kinds of performances were not always optimal and could be challenging, in the end, I always felt that what had just transpired may have been among the most meaningful and impactful of all the things we as musicians do. I share this with you in the hopes that you may learn to not make value judgments about performance, what is important and what is not. There's no such thing. Those experiences were every bit as important as playing at the Kennedy Center, perhaps more so. Yes, we all want to have our share of the wonderful performance opportunities and elevated artistic experiences under optimum conditions. And I wish that for you as well. But I also hope you have the kinds of experiences have the capacity to change people's lives, to open a door, to let a little light in. Nikita and Maggie know what I'm talking about after their experiences in El Paso. And those among you who participated in Creative Access or the Peabody pop-up concerts during your time 
here have also experienced it. Please resist thinking of these as less legitimate or less important as performance. Honor your audience wherever you find them, which will be in some remarkable and unexpected places. You may be frustrated in some ways. The acoustics are not as good. The piano is not as good. Rise above it and recognize that making art and music cannot be relegated to traditional spaces. Go to where people are, meet them on their own terms. Whether you believe this or not now, it will make you a better performer and musician with more heart than you ever dreamed possible. That is the real joy of what we do. Thank you so much, and I wish you the most happiness and joy possible in both your professional and your personal lives. I'm rooting for each and every one of you. And again, congratulations on your accomplishments on this very special day.